I'm Daniel Wordsworth. I've led humanitarian relief efforts in just about every disaster, natural and man-made, for the last 30 years. Smuggled into North Afghanistan in a helicopter after 9-11, made the overland route to Kyiv in the early days of the Ukraine invasion. And I led an emergency team into Sri Lanka after the East Asia tsunami. Across all continents, I've seen the worst of humanity. Terrible tragedy in places like Darfur, Congo, and Somalia. Horrors even worse than you can imagine. I've been in wars, famines, and epidemics. But here's the thing. Having experienced and seen all of this, I believe the world is abundant. As humans, we can make a difference. And I know, not believe, I know that humans are good. The way you see the world is how the world will show up for you. And in this podcast, I'll explain why. We'll talk to leaders, people making a difference, and we'll discuss the issues that impact us as they happen. Hello and welcome to Finding Good with Daniel Wordsworth. Just trying to find a little bit of, well, hopefully inspire some optimism in the world with self-described reluctant optimist, Daniel Wordsworth. Hello, Daniel. Good. It's good to be here. This, this is actually the perfect episode for anyone who remains a reluctant optimist. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, my name's Fitz, by the way. I'm just a tour guide here, pretty much. Um, but it's a pleasure to be here and we're glad you're listening. You can follow along or tell your friends to follow along because we want to share as much of the goodness as we can uh, on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and of course, follow Daniel on the socials or ask a question, head to the website, danielwordsworth.com. Now, I'm excited about today's episode simply because a few episodes ago you discussed, I think it was the climate change episode, you discussed a thing that I, I remember through the Muppet mnemonic, you know, Menomena, FMNR, FMNR. Now, FMNR is, I'm going to get this right, Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration. You got it. It's basically been shepherded through, I don't want to say creative, but shepherded through by one man yeah. who lives here in Melbourne. Right. And uh, and he works with you. He does. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> His name's Tony Renato and actually he's here and he, he's going to be here on uh, today's podcast. He is one of my great discoveries since coming back to Australia. Somebody said to me, it must feel like you're the person that discovered the Beatles. And I do feel a little bit like this. After you do this work for a long time, um, whenever anyone tells you, They've discovered the magic bullet. Mm -hmm. You always, I mean, I don't believe any of that stuff. I didn't believe any of that stuff until now. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's very rare that you meet something that where you, when you learn about it, actually the earth moves a little bit for you. And actually I think what Tony's done and what he does through Farmer Managed Natural Regeneration and this sort of turbocharging of entire forests, yep, is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And a perfect symbol, really, of everything that we're trying to get across on this podcast. All right? You can look at a desert and see yet nothing but desert, or you can look just under the surface and see a vast underground forest. Regrowing deserts is the key to climate change. Now, is that – you've said this. Is that hyperbole? Well, actually, we got uh, Tony here. Maybe we should ask him that question. He's sitting right here. So, and I would say this: I don't say it's the key, it's the you know the only thing for climate, but is it something that can have a big impact on it? I believe yes, but um, but Tony's the expert. Hello, Tony. Hi. <laughs> so, is it hyperbole? Can it fix climate change? It, it's a very large part of the solution. So, if we can do this at scale. Uh, restore vegetation on, on previously barren landscapes. It gives us enormous potential to draw down excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's not the total solution. We still have to get our act together, but it's it's a, a thing that we can really run with, uh, do at low cost, quickly, and we can do this at scale. Yeah, it's like imagine creating the world's biggest vacuum cleaner, right? So you've got all this carbon in the atmosphere. We're pumping it up in there all the time. And that's, I mean, you know, when Tony's saying there's more we've got to do, we've got to stop sticking all this stuff up in the atmosphere. But a big part of it is sucking out all the stuff that's already there. And FMNR, I, we think, can have a huge impact on that. And, and the wonderful thing is there's no real downside to this. Just say climate change was out of the equation. Mm. It's still the best thing to do to reduce poverty and migration and conflict and hunger 
because fixing fixing degraded landscapes is is a good thing to do. Then you add to that climate change, well, it becomes even better. If we do this at scale, even, say, a billion hectares, then you've got the potential to draw down up to a quarter of existing CO2 in the atmosphere. So it, it's enormous. So, okay, <laughs> explain it to me <laughs> in, in a way that I understand. Explain. So what is farmer-managed natural regeneration? At, at the basic, it's regenerating uh, tree stumps, uh, sometimes seeds in the ground that mm. are already there. And what, what happens normally is the, the, this vegetation is there, but it gets slashed. People are in desperate need of fuel wood. It gets trampled by livestock, gets ploughed over. So it never has the opportunity to regrow and become the tree that it is, yeah. but it's been suppressed. So FMNR, farmer managed, farmers making an active decision, I will restore some level of vegetation on my agricultural land or pastoral land, or in some cases where we work with a whole community, a degraded forest. I, I will work with what's there and regenerate it to, to tree status. Very, very simple stuff. The alternative to this in, in the past before you discovered this was what? People were trying to replant deserts. Well, one way to address this is, is to say he's got an origin story which ties into this very thing that you're talking about, going from tree planting to regenerating forests. But what, what, tell us your ori origin story. So, so my family and I were posted in Niger Republic, West Africa. So borderland of the Sahara Desert, one of the poorest countries in the world, and uh, incredible desertification, land degradation occurring. And I inherited a pre-existing tree planting project that was totally failing. And it wasn't for lack of trying. I, I read every paper I could get my hands on. I grabbed any consultant I could get and I, I experimented different species, different methods of planting, different timing. Nothing worked in a sustainable, economically viable way. And it was, it was doomed to failure. Other large projects, whether it was World Bank or USAID, even the government of Niger, in those harsh environments, succeeding with tree planting is extremely difficult. It's very unlikely. And in my case, probably 80, 90% of the trees died. And so I was very frustrated. Because well, you're going to walk along with a watering can and keep watering them, right? Well, well, this is another issue. You can't. Maybe you could water them at planting, but the wells there were up to 60, 80 metres deep. There were no pumps mm. and people are desperately poor. They're trying to make a living. There's no way you're going to water those trees. Yeah. Then there's no fencing. So lots of goats, harsh environment, no rain for eight months of the year. Yeah. It's not conducive to growing no, a forest no, from scratch. No. And, but the, the ridiculous thing is the solution was literally at our feet and many of these landscapes were previously forested. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a repository of living stumps of seeds in the ground that are hardy and dormant. And the FMNR, I described a little bit the, the technical side, but it's more about mindset change. Right. And it's much of what I do actually. 95% of my work is regreening mindscapes. And if I can convince parents and communities that it's in your best interest, that if you work with nature instead of always destroying it and allow some of these trees to come back, you can actually create the future that you want for yourself and your children. And that actually is my hook, much more than saying, yeah, you should regreen your landscape. That mm. doesn't <laughs> do, do much. But if you say you can create a future for yourself and your children, people become interested. Does that resonate? Very much so. I've, I've taught this in probably 30 countries around the world and what I've learned is every parent, no matter what culture, religion, race, every parent wants a better future for their children than the current reality that they're experiencing, which too often is not very nice. Can I add one little bit just to what Tony is saying, right, is this that when he's talking about stumps, the observation that's, that he's made is that when you have a large forest and you have a big tree canopy, right, the way we see forests, what we've got to imagine is that it's like there's a mirror reflection of the forest. So you see all these trees on the surface. You've got to use your imagination and imagine if you could see under the surface, yes. you would see a mirror reflection in the root system. Yes. And the observation is the roots look like the trees. So even if you cut down all the trees, it's like the reflection remains. Mm -hmm. But it sticks up 
like these little stumps, right? Because people are going along, cutting down trees, using it for firewood or clearing their land. So they cut the trees down. They maybe leave a few inches, you know, above the soil. And those trees are trying to be trees again. So they're, like, they're coming up in all these little tendrils and maybe there's 15 tendrils that are coming up and they're all fighting together for nutrients. They're all fighting to survive and they strangle one another and then the goats come along and eat them and then they get cut down. And so the tree is never given space to just be and grow and be what it wants to be, which is a large towering tree. And so his discovery was there is actually a way that you can unlock this vast forest and you can like create these turbocharged trees. So instead of taking, what, 20 years to grow or something, these trees grow in four years, five years. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually, it's a shocking realization that it doesn't take decades to make a forest that if the, the network is there, you can grow one in four or five years. How long ago did you discover this? Oh, this was about <laughs> 1983. Wow. Okay, hang on. So that's that's a long time ago. <laughs> that's 40 years, right? Why does everyone not know about this? Why is this not everywhere? Why are people not talking about FM and, or are they? And I'm just deaf to it. Well, we've definitely turned a corner, but it has taken much, much longer than what I expected. And I, I think partly it's, it's a little bit of a slap in the face for the experts that have spent millions of dollars and, and uh, expertise trying to resolve these problems and largely failed. No, you're not telling me I haven't heard about it because of someone's ego. <laughs> well, it's a part of the it's a part of the mix because and and then the other thing is it's totally unexpected. Who are the heroes in this story? The poorest, the most risk averse, often illiterate people in the world created a movement in Niger Republic that's raced across that country at the rate of a quarter of a million hectares per year for 20 years. And at the end of that period, there were 200 million trees across five million hectares of farmland without planting a single one. So, so nobody, nobody expected uh, peasant farmers to be at the forefront of technology. The second surprising thing is, I think with our Western mindsets, we feel, oh, the system's broken. We have to fix it. We need technology and uh, funding and we're going to make some very complex, sophisticated uh, thing to fix it up. The surprising thing is nature is willing and ready to heal itself if we take the brakes off. All those constraints that stop it from self-healing, fire, ploughing, cutting, uh, overgrazing, if we alter or remove those constraints, even in these dry areas, I've even been to hyper-arid areas, often the underground forest is there ready and waiting for a chance to come back. It's astounding. So what, why haven't we heard about it? I, I think it, it's taken time, first of all, for uh, scientific evidence that, yes, this has happened, it's not a myth, and uh, for more and more people to be adopting it, it's, it's getting harder and harder to ignore. And then with the likes of World Vision really getting their energy and size behind it, it's, it's a little bit hard to ignore that now. <laughs> yeah, right. Does it need a sexy new name? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel doesn't well, think so. I wonder what well, is FMNR like, you know, is no one's wearing it on a T-shirt. <laughs> well, we've been round and round this. It is what it is and, and technically it will probably always keep that name. But if a different name helps it to sell better, go for it. Hmm. Have well, you got any he, ideas? No, well, here's another way of putting it, right? Because FMNR is the technique. Right, so it's like the way that you release these forests. And so it involves things like the way you cut the tree, the way you identify the tree, the way you protect the tree, the way that you manage the water system, the way that you change the mindsets of the people that live there. Now, even in saying that, it may sound like it's super complicated. It's, it's really not. It's yeah. re it, it can be done. I mean, did you hear those numbers? Did you say, how, how many trees did you say in those years? 200 million. There are 200 million trees without planting one. I mean, that's a shock. This is a, I am shocked. And, and then <laughs> and five minutes, when I heard this, this is what I mean by the bit, I'm like you, I'm like, uh, I think I'm hearing the, the greatest rock band of all time and everybody else is like just sitting, drinking and smoking and no yeah. one's paying any attention. Everyone should be up there and dancing. So uh, I still say this all the time. Why isn't everybody up there and dancing? Yeah, so FMNR is this technique and 
it, I think it's some of the power of it. It acknowledges that it's farmers that do this. It isn't just fancy people coming from the West that are doing this. Yeah. It's not the big brains and the scientists. It's the actual local people that own the land are making these decisions. And that's what gives it the power to be amplified and to do more. And it's already out there. There are there's millions now farmers using it. This is its name. But what we could say is we could now frame this more in the goal. Like what are we going to do with this thing? Yeah. Well, we're going to maybe regenerate 1 billion hectares. We're going to try to pull 25% of carbon out of the atmosphere. We're going to create the world's largest vacuum cleaner. We're going to make the world better. And we're going to use the technique of FMNR to do it. And achievable, pulling 25% of carbon out of the atmosphere? Oh, definitely. The, the 1 billion hectares is actually much more degraded land than 1 billion hectares. And I, I like to use this example. When I was a teenager, I used to help my dad. And he, he had a farm machinery business. And... Um, we would deliver these uh, tobacco curing units. So if you can picture in your mind an oversized giant fridge weighing maybe 700 kilograms, and here's this skinny teenager and a dad passed his prime. And the first time we did this, I was saying, Dad, we've got a ute. you got that 700 kilogram thing on the back and we have to get it off the ute, roll it over to the, um, to the exact place on the kiln where it belongs and there's just the two of us. How are we going to do this? And he just smiled at me and laughed. And he had he had a, a jemmy bar, four bits of metal pipe, and and me to help him. And we, we stopped that vehicle, we rolled that off the mm. off the um, ute on a plank and put it precisely in place. So it's all about leverage. Is, is this doable? One billion hectares is a ridiculous number. And I said that to Daniel the first time we talked about Did he just give you the number? Did he say, what, no, I want a no, billion hectares? It's no. my, I, I own this car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I own it. But it's a ridiculous number on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's totally achievable through leverage. Hmm. Uh, we're talking about probably 500 million smallholder farmers in the world all of them desperately trying to survive and create a better life for themselves. And here's this solution literally at your feet, within your means. You don't need external experts or funding beyond uh, awareness creation and a little bit of teaching. You can run with this. So 500 million people out there with land. And then I, I take the power of FMNR itself. And I wouldn't be so passionate. I wouldn't have wasted my life on this thing if I didn't totally believe no, it. It's not a waste. <laughs> it's not a waste. And and if you look at where did this story emerge? In the most unlikely place on earth, the edge of the Sahara Desert, in one of the very poorest countries in the world, at the time with absolutely no government support. And the organisation I belonged to was very small. Our investment in this was minuscule. And yet... In that obscure corner in the world, they achieved a rate of a quarter of a million hectares per year. And what, what I like to argue is, what about now? We can multiply this simultaneously in many countries at once. We have the size and power of world vision. Mm. We can bring in the government entities to create favourable enabling policies. At, at the very least, people need the assurance, if I do this work, I want to benefit. Yeah. Often that's not the case at the moment. We can bring in sister organisations. Come on, there's plenty for all of us to do. Come and join us. The education institutions and the research institutions. That We should be able to make that rate of a quarter of a million hectares a year look like kids' stuff. Yeah, wow. So what do you need? Like, Anyone listening to this podcast that has the epiphany that Daniel had and go, well, hang on, I've just seen the Beatles and no, one, no one's paying attention. What can they do to support this, to get the word out, to, to grow it? Like, it, what, what is it? What, what's needed? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure Daniel will add, but uh, first of all, make yourself aware. Is it really everything that Tony says it is? There's lots of literature out there on the web now. Yeah. Study it for yourself. There's a movie, right? There's, there's a documentary. For there's it. a documentary movie coming out in, on SBS uh, 5th of June, I think, okay. uh, World Environment Day. So be become aware and draw your own conclusion. Is this hype or is it real? What's it called? The Forest Maker. Oh, and it's about you? Well, it, it's a, uh, yes, it's about me. It's about, <laughs> it's about my work. <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the, Tony, one of the things that's really um, moved me about this and we can joke about uh, discovering the Beatles, but you have put 40 years into this. And a lot of it, 
I don't think you've got your due, and I don't think that FMNR has had its due. Now, again, we're, we're changing that. But, like, how do you stick at it for 40 years? I'm, what was there? <laughs> well, um, a lot goes back to a childhood prayer. And I, I grew up in a beautiful part of Australia, northeast Victoria, lovely mountain streams. As kids, we used to swim there, fish, drink from the water. At that time, people using aeroplanes to spray DDT on the farms and often the drift would go on the river and kill the fish. The hills were being cleared and steep hills left a fallow for years on end. There was erosion, loss of biodiversity. So I, I think I was a pretty angry kid. <laughs> At the same time, I was very curious about the world. I'd watch the news, I'd read, and I realised that while the main crop in our valley was tobacco, children just like me who through no fault of their own were going to bed hungry. And I, I was cross but I felt frustrated. What could I do to speak into the adult world and, and change things? I felt powerless. But my, I was very influenced by my mum. She had strong faith and, and I just shot up at child's prayer. Please use me somehow, somewhere to make a difference. And so the, the sticking to it is also trying to be faithful to that prayer. But there was a real turning point. There's a Tony before 1984 and a Tony after 1984. So when I was a kid, I'd seen starvation on television, but I didn't know those people. There's no relationship. It affected me emotionally, but you could just as easily walk, walk away after the TV show and forget it. I'd lived in Niger for nearly three years by 1984. These, the people that I was working with were, were my friends. I'd slept in their huts, I'd eaten their food, and I reciprocated when they came to my place in the town. 1983, the rains failed totally. I don't mean, you know, a little bit of rain, almost totally, no rain, the crops failed. And in these countries, there's no social service. Uh, if your crop fails, that's it. The men left home uh, trying to find food and work to send back home. The women hung on for as long as they could, but eventually even they had to leave with their children. And so I saw the suffering, the unnecessary suffering. A lot of this, yes, there was climate change. I wasn't so aware of that at the time. It was a factor in decreasing the average rainfall. But I was very aware of the direct result of deforestation on the land's ability to accept and hold what rain did come and to provide alternatives if your main crop failed. If you have a healthy, diverse landscape, People can still survive. That was all gone. And then for an intense period of maybe eight months, I, I was involved in famine relief, seeing terrible things that I don't think anyone should see. And I was very young then, very <laughs> impressionable. It affected me deeply. And 1984 happened to be the year after we discovered this underground forest and through the relief program we were promoting FMNR. And so I made a vow to myself, to the degree possible, I never want to see people going through this disaster again. And I've become a global campaigner promoting FMNR <laughs> in season, out of season. If you mention it, you'll just get a flood of descriptions on what FMNR can do. And yes, there's been hard times, there's been criticism, personal failures, other people's failures that have tried to derail the work and that... But that, those two things, the, the faith aspect, but what's the alternative? Do we do nothing when we know we can prevent that kind of suffering? Can't do it. <laughs> what's the line you use in the face of? In the face of the impossible, we do the doable. This, this is the man. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing the doable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's funny for me, um, I draw two things to the most. One is every time I get to one thing where I say this is the one thing that, that won't work, right? So mm -hmm. when you say that the world is much, there's much more to this world than you think, even in the poorest of places, it is mind blowing what you find there. And then when when you meet people and you think they're much better than you, people are. What will shock you is how good they are, not how bad. Well, that's really the shocking experience of life. And then thirdly, the realization that you can come together and that you can actually make a difference. And yet this has been like this unfolding thing for me. And yet 
every few years or so I say I'm now about to look at a thing because this is the reluctant optimist part, right? Because yeah. part of the reluctant optimist is how can you be optimistic in some of these places because there's so much suffering and it feels wrong to be it, yeah? And uh, we did one episode about Congo and we went in there and like we, we were charging people for healthcare and clean water and my own daughter said, Dad, how can you... How can you possibly do that? Charge them for these things. And I said, no, I, there's more in this place than you think. Yep. Then I, I gave the story in another podcast was when we had the Ebola outbreak and we thought we have to send people to work in an Ebola treatment unit. And then at the time I said, that's the one time that the abundance of the world and the good, that's the one time when no one is, no one, like it, it works almost everywhere, but it won't work in Ebola. And then the website got shut down and so many people wanted to go. It was mind blowing. And then one of the last things for me was my daughter would also ask me for 10 years, what are you doing with climate? Like you, you do all these other things. What do you do? And I would say for 10 years, oh, there's nothing you can do for climate. There's nothing. Yeah, we're lost on that one. Like the world isn't abundant enough for that. There isn't good people out there working on it and there's nothing we can all do. And then it's like I come here and I, it's like a miracle waiting for me. Yeah, I, I walk through a door and there's Tony's literally sitting in a cube and you discover in a very literal way that even in the desert in, of Niger and this is the edge of the Sahara Desert, yeah. out of there, it turns out there's a whole forest there. Like this is mind-blowing to me. turns out... Name the most barren place on earth, okay, edge of Sahara Desert in Niger, okay. There's nothing, whole forests, 200 million trees waiting under the ground. Get this, 200 million trees under the ground, like some Lord of the Rings thing, waiting to become trees again is so beautiful. <laughs> and then you go, and who on earth would spend 20 years in Niger and then have the patience of Job for 40 years and to keep trying to tell this story everywhere he goes. Who would be, of course there's a guy called Tony that would do it and he's sitting here in Burwood, <laughs> right? And then you go, and then are there enough people that want to do good in the world? There's millions of farmers yeah. that are willing to do this. Well, I was just thinking like, you know, Tony, as you said, sitting here in Burwood and not blowing his own trumpet, not telling everyone about what an amazing job he's doing. Imagine how many other people in the world are like Tony that have ideas or things that they've realised or come up with that, that are being unheard. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. Now, I, I know you would love that idea. I'm a bit, I'm, you're a reluctant optimist. I'm a bit more of a robust cynic, but... Uh, you know, you can't help but think if this if this exists here. Sorry to talk about you while you're next to us, Tony. <laughs> but if if that exists here, it's got to exist everywhere else uh, in the world. It, and by the way, it totally does. That's like the point with Sister Irene. The point with Abraham, a refugee. All of his ones are. Oh no, I I can actually pro I can promise you. Hmm. And even on the issues that you think are the worst issues, like you go to ground zero of gang violence in Latin America. The three gangs, the three biggest, most dangerous gangs in the entire world meet at one intersection and who's on the fourth corner? Three nuns. Yep. yep. It's shocking uh, how true this is. And what's amazing for me is it's like a, a lesson that is trying to be beaten into my head. Every time I come to a thing where I go, this is the one thing that this will not hold true for, I get shown, I oh, don't know, this one's here. In a beautiful way. He's like, so I know we're talking... But I, it is so emblematic, uh, Tony, uh, of how good the world is. You need to get yourself a new PR person, I think. Uh, <laughs> start blowing your trumpet. I'm looking forward to seeing The Forest Maker, the documentary. That well, he's, got a, he's got also got a book. Um, the Forest Underground, Hope for a Planet in Crisis. The, the re-greening is wonderful. And I, I get a thrill every time I go back into these communities and you see re restored landscapes mm. and the productivity back, people in a much better economic situation. That, that's wonderful. But the biggest change that I see, actually, is the restoration of hope. And this is very, very powerful. And if you can put yourself in the shoes of a parent, what must it be like? You can't feed your kids properly. You can't put decent clothing on them. You can't even afford to send them to school. It's soul-destroying. And a lot of people, I think, have given up hope. They've tried, they've tried and failed so many times, it's not even worth trying anymore. And then here's this really simple thing, literally at your feet, that empowers you to create that better future that you want. 
And when I go back, I, I don't tell Daniel this, it's party mode. <laughs> World Vision pays me and these people want to have a celebration. Tony, Tony, look at what we've achieved. Look at our land. Look, my, my child not only been to school, they're a university graduate. This one's a vet. That one's a headmaster. They're so proud. And tomorrow, all of a sudden, tomorrow looks good. When I get up in the morning, I'm not scared anymore. What will I do today to make today better than yesterday? It's powerful. And what an incredibly fulfilling role that you've played in that as well. It must, it must make you feel good. Oh, blessed, blessed. Um, very, very satisfied. Yeah, very happy. Wow. It's not many people in the world you hear say they're satisfied. Mm. It's so nice to hear that. I, I feel, um, shut your ears, Daniel, I, I, I could leave this job now. I've had the, the privilege of training so many people and there's something about FMNR, it's, um, it's infectious. People get the bug and they become enthusiasts for it. I, I could step away now and the movement wouldn't stop. I, I'm not planning that. <laughs> but, the but, but that's, yeah, that's a wonderful feeling to think it's, it's got a life of its own. It doesn't need me. Yeah. I'm just thinking there. It's infectious. Oh, <laughs> I was going to call it the COVID of reforestation. It's really infectious, but that's the wrong sentiment. Um, <laughs> it, a, a, a good infection, a good infection because it, it spreads. It, it does spread like a virus. We had no knowledge when we lived in Niger for tw- uh, 17 years. We had no knowledge beyond our immediate area of what was happening in the wider Niger it wasn't until I came back here, I joined World Vision and I met up with a researcher. Mm. He'd been looking at satellite images and so on and he, he told us the extent of this. It is infectious and that's, you know, is the billion hectares possible? Yes, yes, this thing's got a life of its own and once people experience the benefits, you can't actually stop it. Beautiful. Tony, thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Daniel. Thank you, Tony. Another great guest. Uh, thanks for listening to Finding Good. Please subscribe and follow on Spotify and Apple and uh, and shoot Daniel an email. You know the website address, danielwordsworth.com, and follow him on the socials. There'll be another episode. You can guarantee that. Thanks for listening. Thank you.